Okay, welcome everybody. Happy Sunday. Welcome to our Outlook webinar for the trading week of July 25th to 29th. My name is Ilyan Yotov. I'm the founder of AllThingsForex.com and TraderTape.com. I'm the host of the popular daily All Things Forex broadcast as well. I'd like to invite all of you to join me Monday through Friday on my website, AllThingsForex.com, and listen to the program. It's a one-hour daily show that covers all the developments in the currency markets. I'd like to thank our friends at fxstreet.com for putting together these webinars. And before we continue, let me remind you that uh, today's program is intended for educational and informational purposes only, and it should not be considered as giving any buy, sell, or hold recommendations. So we're going to discuss the top 10 spotlight events for the new trading week ahead of us. And right off the bat, on Tuesday morning, we're going to start with a very, very important spotlight economic event. That will be the United Kingdom's gross domestic product report. Many of you know the gross domestic product is the main measure of economic activity and growth. In the United Kingdom, in the fourth quarter of 2010, we actually had the economy contracting by 0.5%. The GDP reading for the fourth quarter of 2010 was minus 0.5. Then in the first quarter of 2011, the United Kingdom's economy recovered by 0.5%. We saw a little bit of an expansion by expansion by 0.5%. However, looking at the consensus forecast for Tuesday's release, and that is, of course, the preliminary estimate as to what the um, gross domestic product or economic growth in the United Kingdom was in the second quarter of 2011, well, the consensus forecasts are actually pointing to a much slower economic growth in the second quarter compared with the first. Again, in the first quarter, the economy grew by 0.5%. The consensus forecast for second quarter preliminary estimate GDP is for 0.2%. Some less optimistic forecasts are even expecting only 0.1% quarter over quarter economic growth in the United Kingdom's economy. What does that mean? That means that there's a significant slowdown potentially that we can witness on Tuesday's report with the United Kingdom's economy in the second quarter. So after the contraction in the fourth quarter, Expansion by 0.5% in the first quarter, or fourth quarter of 2010. Expansion by 0.5% in the first quarter of 2011. We're now expecting another slowdown in the United Kingdom's economy. Well, again, the less optimistic forecasts are expecting, still expecting growth by at least 0.1%. But what happens if not only we get to see a slowdown in the United Kingdom's economy in the second quarter, but rather we see another contra contraction. No one's expecting a contraction now. But I'm not excluding the possibility of that. If that happens, then we know that whether a slower economic growth or a contraction, possibly, I'm not saying that that's going to be the outcome of the report. Don't get me wrong. But what if it is? then it could really spook the market as far as their expectations that have already been changing, as we discussed in the last couple of months on this, these programs and these webinars. The market's expectation, the market was pricing in that the Bank of Canada will hike rates in May. Obviously, that was not the case. And as we've discussed here for the last several months, now the market's expectations are being repriced, that the Bank of England will be in no hurry to start hiking interest rates in the near future, at least not in 2011. Well, if that's what the market's expecting, can you imagine what the negative economic growth in the United Kingdom or slower economic growth could do to these expectations? It could make them even more valid. So if we get to see a slowdown or significant slowdown or even possibly a contraction in the United Kingdom's economy, could the British pound actually come under pressure? Could that factor continue to weigh on the British pound if we get to see anemic economic growth in the United Kingdom? I think that that could very well be the case. However, 
As I will show you here in a minute, we'll go to the daily chart of the pound versus the U.S. dollar currency pair. And this is the daily chart of the pound dollar pair. In the last week or so of trading, the pound, which has broken below previous support level, which was a major level of support, it was the bottom of an existing range since February of this year, as we've discussed, Dollar fifty nine thirty seven was that level of support. Now the pound broke a little bit below it. It reached its lowest, dollar fifty nine eleven. That was not that decisive breakout that we were waiting for. The decisive breakout actually came on the thirteenth uh, of July or uh, July twelfth rather, when we saw the pound breaking below dollar fifty nine thirty seven and dollar fifty nine eleven, which were the bottoms of the range since February. And reaching as low as almost an important price level in my quarters theory, which is the large quarter point at the dollar fifty seven fifty. It reached as low as dollar fifty seven seventy nine on the twelfth of July. So that was the decisive breakout below the multi month level of support in existing channel where the pound dollar exchange rate has been trading with them roughly within um 800 pips or so between dollar 59 cents and a dollar 57 dollar uh, 67 50 which is the large quarter point at um, there dollar 67 50 or dollar 67 45 was the previous high right there you can see where my cursor is dollar 67 45 the high of uh, April 28 so that was the channel between roughly dollar 59 and dollar 67 50 so that was a decisive breakout. However, with the U.S. debt ceiling debate really coming to the forefront, and now especially that we have seen after the European Union summit and the new bailout package for Greece being agreed on and so forth, uh, a lot of uh, experts are saying now that, well, with that European Union summit and uh, these bold measures that were announced, the um, European economy and the Eurozone in, in general has been brought back from the brink. Is that really the case? I'm not quite sure that that really was the case, but at least the U.S. dollar has come under significant pressure in the last couple of weeks on the potential for the United States to default on their debt if they, the uh, debt ceiling is not increased. And a deadline is now approaching. Next week is going to be the final week before the vote, before that deadline comes in. And uh, it's going to be very important for any U.S. dollar-related currency pair as to what is going to be the outcome of that debate. There is no agreement as of um, the last five minutes. I'm saying that not ironically because literally every minute – ahead of us, we can see some news breaking out. As a matter of fact, just a few minutes ago, there was a, a, a news article that came out. The Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner, said that he's confident that an agreement has been reached, or at least that the debt ceiling is going to be increased by August the 2nd. So I'm telling you all these things to help you visualize the importance of this decision, of this debate and the vote ultimately, to raise the debt ceiling, the United States has never defaulted on their debt. Uh, in 1995, there was a potential uh, watch that the credit ratings agencies have put the United States in 95 uh, was the last time that happened. That the U.S. Uh, has been put on negative watch for a possible downgrade. That, however, did not happen. The U.S. still has AAA top credit rating. If they default if the debt ceiling is not raised, and the danger is that the U.S. could default. Again, I feel, as I've said in the last several weeks, that a solution will be found even if it is in the 11th hour before the actual deadline. But the British pound has taken full advantage here in the last couple of weeks of that uncertainty surrounding the debt ceiling debate and vote in the United States, and that has been, by the way, putting some pressure on the U.S. dollar. So the pound found an opportunity not only to bounce off of these lows, but to climb right, right back into its previous, previously established range. And again, here's the line here, so you can better visualize it. 
the range between around dollar fifty nine and a large quarter point of dollar sixty seven fifty. So we're back into this range. After breaking below the bottom decisively, if this were if the U.S. debt ceiling debate was not ongoing, more than likely the British pound could have simply continued lower if we were in a normal market environment. But we're not. There is news that are breaking out every day, and we see a lot of volatility in recent days. But one thing that we've seen is, as I said earlier, the pound actually capitalizing on this opportunity, going right back into its previous previously established range, it's now um, pushing $1.6342 in a trading session today. That's at least the intraday high so far, which is an attempt to break above the double top resistance here in the last couple of days at uh, $1.6334. So that's an important level. I would not classify nine-fifths of a move above a resistance level as a decisive breakout, but for the decisive breakout above, that exceeds more than 25 pips in general for me is what I would classify as a more decisive breakout and not just an overshoot. If we continue higher, we could easily see the pound dollar currency pair climbing up to these previous resistance levels. They're pretty close to the dollar and 65 cents large quarter point. We have dollar 64.41 as a resistance level on uh, the 14th of June. And then after that, we have that area which is about dollar sixty four and a half area dollar sixty four sixty serving as an area of dollar uh, sixty four fifty serving as an area of resistance dollar sixty four seventy you might recall also here on uh, June seventh and then of course we have a little overshoot uh, above a dollar sixty five cents large quarter point uh, I think a decisive breakout above this double top resistance could send us to test these previous resistance levels that are approaching the large quarter point at the dollar and 65 cents. If the pound, however, comes under pressure as a result of a uh, disappointing or anemic economic growth in the United Kingdom on Tuesday morning, that could be a major risk factor for that bullish scenario for the pound to continue climbing higher. But as long as the, there is uncertainty surrounding the U.S. Uh, debt ceiling debate and vote, the U.S. dollar could still suffer the consequences and could still be under pressure, not only versus the British pound, but as you have noticed in the last couple of weeks, the dollar has really come under pressure across the board. So, uh, But be aware that there is a risk event for any pound strengthening uh, future strengthening uh, after 4.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday morning, especially if the gross domestic product report from the U.K. is actually uh, disappointing. The second top 10 spotlight event that I have chosen for next week will be the second part of the U.S. housing data. Uh, after the existing home sales that were rather disappointing as well, weaker uh, than expected existing home sales is what we witnessed last week. Uh, we're expecting the new home sales to not be all that impressive either. The consensus forecasts are actually expecting, um, and those are a little bit more of the optimistic forecasts, uh, they're expecting a small increase to 321,000 in June from 319,000 in the month of May. Uh, again, for such a large country and the largest economy in the world like the United States, three th or 2,000, rather, um, new home sales higher in June than May, that's very insignificant. On the other hand, on top of that, we have some less optimistic forecasts that are actually expecting the new home sales to remain flat, 0% increase in June. And I wouldn't even exclude the possibility that they could, they could be even weaker than expected, just as the existing home sales. In other words, this could be another report that shows us that the housing market in the United States is far from any recovery. So what do we know so far the market's reaction has been to any negative U.S. economic data, or at least weak economic data. As I've explained many, many weeks ago, and continue to explain that today, 
we have greater probability if the U.S. economic data is not showing the signs of recovery, especially the one from the labor market or from the housing market, which are both very closely related, by the way, then the Fed will be in absolutely no hurry to begin tightening their ultra-accommodative monetary policy. As a matter of fact, if the U.S. economic conditions deteriorate even more, we have recently seen even the Federal Reserve Chairman, Ben Bernanke, in his testimony in front of the House Banking Committee, was it last Wednesday or so, opening the door to the possibility for QE number three. What is QE number three? That's quantitative easing number three, a possible third round of quantitative easing, which we know the first two have been very detrimental to the U.S. dollar strength. A third one, if that's a possibility, could really be a major factor for additional U.S. dollar weakness. Now, that was the statement we heard from Mr. Bernanke, the Fed chairman, on last Wednesday. Then on Thursday he came out, he backtracked a little bit. He said, well, you know, there is a possibility of the economic conditions deteriorate, but with just saying that the Fed thinks that this is just a temporary soft patch and the economy is going to be stronger in the uh, near future. So it's not going to be very likely that QE3 is going to come. Fine, but that still really spooked the markets. And I was driving, I remember just, I wasn't in front of my computer, just driving when I heard on the radio that uh, Ben Bernanke had said that in his statement, and I went, oh, here we go again. In other words, more U.S. dollar weakness. So we need to be very careful if U.S. economic data is weak and we see conditions deteriorating with the economy, that there is a possibility that QE number three could be in the works. And it could come sooner than some might actually think, especially if the economy turns for the worse. So new home sales would be more than likely not a very good, not a very strong report. But then on uh, Tuesday night, we're going to see the Australian Consumer Price Index, the main measure of inflation. It's a, a widely, widely anticipated report. And the reason for that is because, as I explained last Sunday with the New Zealand Consumer Price Index, which came a little bit higher uh, even than the consensus forecast, in Australia and New Zealand, the Consumer Price Indexes, unlike other major economies, are not reported on a monthly basis, but rather on a quarterly basis. And that's what makes the impact of that report even more interesting, if you will or could be a more major, if you will, type of an impact. Especially now that the fourth largest bank, uh, not fourth, but one of the four largest, if I'm not mistaken, Westpac Banking Company or Corporation is the largest bank in Australia. Analysts there a couple of weeks ago have come out and forecast that uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia is going to actually cut interest rates, not to raise interest rates, cut interest rates by the end of 2011. They're the first one of the large Australian banks to make such a forecast. Now, we know that if inflationary pressures are not rising, then that could be supported of such view. And we could see, according to the consensus forecast, a smaller increase in the consumer price index, the main gauge of inflation in Australia, by 0.7% in the second quarter compared with 1.6% increase in the first quarter of 2011. If that really is the case, then we could see an indication of subsiding inflationary pressures in Australia. Couple that with another factor that I've been talking about like a broken record in the last couple of months, and that is the signs of a slowdown from China. Chinese central bank raising rates to cool things off, to curb rising inflation there. Chinese economy slowing, not dramatically, but slowing, could actually mean lower demand for Australian produced raw material exports. What does that mean? That means a potentially negative impact on Australian economic growth. And now if inflationary pressures begin to subside, 
slower economic growth in Australia coupled with uh, subsiding inflationary pressures, and we could have the formula that may be in line with Westpac economists' expectations, that the Reserve Bank of Australia will not hike rates, not only not raise rates, but rather even consider a possible interest rate cut, and possibly by the end of 2011. Just as the British pound, however, the Australian dollar, which we noted on this program for a number of weeks, has been lagging that strong upward momentum to produce a breakout here for a number of weeks. Notice the triple, uh, the triple top here that we've discussed previously. I even drew a line for you here to acknowledge that resistance area. That was the top of the existing range in the last couple of months, where the Aussie US dollar exchange rate has been trading within the lows at around dollar and four cents and the highs at around the large quarter point, a little bit above the large quarter point at the dollar zero seven fifty. In particular, dollar zero seven seventy four and dollar zero seven eighty six. There were recent levels of resistance. Finally, finally last week, because of the uncertainty surrounding the U.S. debt ceiling and the dollar coming under pressure, the feeling of relief, if you will, after the European Union summit, that Greece is getting the bailout, that, that there are some comprehensive measures. Now, I have my doubts, and I'll talk about them in a few minutes. But investor sentiments improving, the focus really shifting on the problems, the debt problems here in the United States, not only on the debt problems in the Eurozone, the Australian dollar finally managed to capitalize on this U.S. dollar weakness and produce a decisive breakout above the top of its monthly range, a couple of months of a range here. Uh, we had the Aussie rallying on Friday as high as um, dollar zero eight. What was it? Dollar zero eight seventy four, almost to the dollar and nine cents level. And uh, anybody surprised there? I said if we were to break above this uh, triple top resistance above the bottom of the channel, the first level of resistance would be dollar zero eight eighty eight. Well, we saw the Aussie reaching as high as dollar zero eight seventy four, so not too far from that resistance level. That is the most immediate resistance level that we need to watch heading into the new trading week, dollar zero eight eighty eight. Now, if the U.S. dollar continues to trade under pressure. If there is serious uncertainty, and it will get closer and closer to the due date, uh, which is August 2nd, for the debt on the, uh, the vault on the debt ceiling. If the credit trading agency is next week, which is a possibility that we need to be aware of, credit trading agencies like Moody's or uh, Standard & Poor's have warned about the potential downgrade in a credit rating of the United States. If that's the kind of news that comes next week, the U.S. dollar could really, really feel and suffer the consequences of that. So that could be the catalyst for the Australian dollar to break higher above this resistance level at $0.0888. If, however, the Australian dollar begins to lack upward momentum and come Tuesday night, at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time is when we're going to see the Consumer Price Index report from Australia, which I already told you the consensus forecasts are expecting a smaller increase, which means subsiding inflationary pressures in the second quarter compared with the first quarter. If that's the outcome of that report, and we don't get to see some awful, negative, hurtful for the U.S. dollar news, then the Australian dollar could stay under that resistance level and uh, it could start once again losing that momentum come Tuesday night. However, after that decisive breakout that we witnessed last week, the odds are uh, very, very strong that the Australian dollar could challenge that resistance level and it could actually break it if the dollar continues to be sold off across the board. A break above dollar zero eight eighty eight which is the most immediate resistance level ahead of us, would mean that the Aussie dollar pair would then challenge 
the major large quarter point and previous record highs around the dollar and 10 cents. The previous record high for the Aussie versus the US dollar that was reached in uh, May was dollar 10, 11, 11 pips, as I call it, of an overshoot above the major large quarter point at the dollar and 10 cents. So that's the bullish scenario ahead okay, for the Aussie dollar pair. As I said, with the British pound, major risk event for the Australian dollar strength is that consumer price index report on Tuesday night. There's two ways to play it. Australian dollar weakness failure to break above that resistance level sends the dollar lower. Australian dollar decisive breakout above this level sends it to dollar and 10 cents level. Needless to say, that's the very important price level ahead of us for the Aussie versus the dollar. And one of our uh, regular listeners, John from Toronto, asked about the outlook for the Aussie dollar and for the Kiwi dollar. Here is the Aussie dollar outlook. And John, in a couple of minutes, I will discuss the New Zealand dollar because next week we also have a major event coming up from New Zealand, not just from Australia. We have the Reserve Bank of New Zealand interest rate announcement coming up on Wednesday night. Before that announcement, we're going to see another important event from the United States economic report that once again could be unimpressive. And that is the U.S. durable goods orders. Looking at the consensus forecast, by the way, for the U.S. economic data throughout next week, just looking at the consensus forecast, if they actually are uh, accurate, and that's what we witnessed throughout next week, we could see a sequence of not only unimpressive U.S. economic data, but downright weak U.S. economic data. And I already explained earlier what the consequences of weak economic data from the United States could be. Durable goods orders are expected to increase by 0.5% month over month in June. So you'll say, well, it's an increase. Yeah. But compared with the 2.1% month-over-month increase in May, that's actually a four times lower amount of durable goods orders increasing on a month-over-month basis. So yet another weak economic report we might witness with the durable goods orders on next Wednesday. And by the way, the new home sales that I showed you earlier they're going to be released at the same time as uh, with another U.S. economic event that's an important one, and that's the consumer sentiment uh, or consumer confidence index by the conference board here in the United States. That also is expected to be lower in June compared with May. So you have the new home sales. You have the, dur- uh, you have the uh, uh, investors' uh, consumer confidence, which could be weak. You have the durable goods orders that could be weak, and I'll show you by the end of the week another couple of reports that might be on the weak side as well. Before that, however, we'll get to the main event from New Zealand for next week, and that's the Reserve Bank of New Zealand interest rate announcement. Although the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is not expected to hike interest rates that soon, meaning as early as next week. Next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, when we, uh, we could see, it would make sense, uh, in my opinion, uh, if you have a mainly exporting economy, which is the economy of New Zealand, and you have your currency in a literally unstoppable rally, as we have witnessed the New Zealand dollar in recent weeks and months, versus the U.S. dollar and other majors, it would make sense that a central bank might express some concerns about the negative impact of that continuously rising currency on New Zealand exports. I mean, at some point, this could be very, very painful, which I think at that point we might be either there already or we might be getting close to that point. So I wouldn't be surprised, and that could be a risk event, obviously, for the New Zealand dollar on uh, Wednesday night, if the Reserve Bank of New Zealand warns about the rapid appreciation of their uh, currency, the New Zealand dollar. On the other hand, 
the market is still pricing in a rate hike by the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Earlier I discussed that we're actually starting to see the market expecting, and some economists at the major financial institutions in Australia and so forth, expecting that the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia will actually cut rates rather than raise them. Well, that's not the expectation for the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. The market is actually expecting a rate hike before the end of the year, which can only increase the yield advantage of the New Zealand dollar over lower yielding currencies such as the United States dollar or the Japanese yen, with the Fed and the Bank of Japan literally keeping interest rates at 0%. So an interest rate hike that's being expected and priced into the New Zealand dollar exchange rate could continue to be supportive for the New Zealand dollar's rally. However, any type of warnings from the central bank could be a risk event for the Kiwi. I wanted to help you visualize what I call the unstoppable uh, bullish uh, trend and rally of the New Zealand dollar versus the U.S. dollar. And here's the daily chart of the Kiwi against the U.S. dollar. Remember we had a previous resistance here, but that was last week, right? It's already been broken above, and we have some new record highs now being reached on Friday at uh, 0.8674 for uh, one U.S. dollar for one New Zealand dollar. That means that we're approaching a, an important level in my quarters theory, which is the next large quarter point that could be challenged. What would that large quarter point be? 0.875 will be that level. So that's the level to watch, especially if next week the New Zealand dollar manages to successfully break above the, the recently established high on Friday, which is a new record high at uh, 0.8674. This, by the way, will only be about 75 pips from the large quarter point, the next large quarter point targeted, which is the large quarter point at 0.8750. So we'll watch that level next week that could be reached, at least the area of 0.8750, if we get to see a decisive breakout above 0.8674. The New Zealand dollar is one of the few currency pairs that's actually trending in uh, the last several months. A lot of majors like the euro dollar pair, the pound dollar pair that I was showing you earlier, even the Australian dollar versus the US dollar, were stuck in ranges. With the New Zealand dollar, that's not been the case. It's a straight uptrend since March, you can see here. And it's now, we have seen moves from as low as... Um, 0.7111 or 0.7114, uh, the low from March 17 to new record highs of 0.8674. It's a very strong bullish trend. It's going to be difficult to reverse that trend, uh, although I feel that the New Zealand dollar is actually due for some more significant price correction, especially considering that it has been rallying here for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight consecutive trading sessions. This is a very strong, what I call bullish trend wave, but eight days old to me is what I would classify as overextended. And when we get to see these overextended trends or trend waves, I'd like to be prepared for what could be a more significant price correction. At least a price correction not of this entire move, but at least a price correction of the current bullish wave, which started from as low as 0.8110 to the high, uh, the new record high at 0.8674. Now, whether it's 0.8674 that ends up being the high of this wave, or 0.87, or 0.8750. Now, it might extend itself another 70 pip, 75 pips or so to the, to the large quarter point area at 0.8750. I'm not excluding that possibility. But if you round things up, you will see that there's been a rally here of approximately 600 pips. So up to 50% retracement of this current 
strong but overextended bullish wave could mean that the New Zealand dollar could fall and move lower by at least uh, 300 pips, provided the market goes to uh, target and goes with the so-called perfect 50% retracement. If it doesn't go with up to 50%, at least maybe 30%, 38.2% of that is another Fibonacci level that might be helpful. As far as us establishing ballpark figures, what uh, any price correction, uh, if the Kiwi loses that upward momentum and becomes a little bit exhausted, if you will, after eight days of running, wouldn't you feel a little more exhausted? I think that would make sense for us to be extra cautious when we get to see these type of uh, overextended uh, uh, trend developments. Who's to say that this is not going to continue for another eight days? It, is it possible? You bet it's possible. Last September, the euro rallied versus the U.S. dollar for 19 consecutive trading sessions. That's one nine, 19 consecutive trading sessions. I thought I'd seen it all, but last September, when the euro did that, showed me that I have not seen it all. So it is possible. What are the odds that we can witness that? In a lot of instances, in most instances, not very great type of odds. That's why we need to be uh, on the lookout and be prepared when potential overextended waves like this show us these red flags, if you will, that could point to a loss of momentum that uh, could happen at any time and a price correction that could kick in at any time. I'm not talking about a reversal of the bullish New Zealand dollar trend. Do not me get me wrong here. All I'm talking about is just a long due, in my opinion, price correction. All right. So that's what we uh, can see next week for the Kiwi against the U.S. dollar and uh, – what did I just click on? Hold on one second. All right. After the Reserve Bank of New Zealand interest rate announcement on Tuesday, on Wednesday night, it's going to be time for another U.S. economic report and another housing market report. On top of that, the pending home sales index, which is a leading indicator of housing market activity, it uh, tracks. It's an index based on. Uh, Contracts, contracts that have been signed for uh, homes to be sold. It takes about 30 to 60 days for a home to be sold here in the United States. So this is a leading indicator of uh, housing market activity in the U.S. Now, the pending home sales index had a nice, sharp, move increasing by 8.2% month over month in the month of May. Stronger than expected. Problem is, however, that next Thursday's report could show the index actually dropping by 1% month over month in June, according to the consensus forecast. What does that tell us? Another unimpressive, weak economic report from the U.S economy, and housing market. Also on Thursday night, we're going to see the main gauge of inflation from Japan, the consumer price index there, which uh, thankfully by the Jap for the Japanese authorities has been managing to climb above 0%, below zero, many of you know, consumer price index reading below zero means deflation rather than inflation. And the Japanese inflation index has managed to climb above 0% recently, and census forecasts are expecting it to stay above 0% as well for another month, with a reading of 0.5%, up by 0.5% month over month in June. However, that would be a little bit lower than a 0.6% month over month in May. When it comes to the Japanese yen, it is all about safe haven, flight to safety, relative safety of the Japanese yen, and that has been the main reason, as I will show you now with the daily chart of the dollar versus the Japanese yen, for the recent weakness of the U.S. dollar. Lots of uncertainty, as we've discussed previously, about the outcome of the debt uh, 
ceiling debate involved here in the U.S. has transpired into a decisive bearish break for the U.S. dollar versus the Japanese yen below this range. In the last couple of months, there was a range. The bottom of the range was 79.56, as we have discussed previously on this webinar. Top of the range was 82.23 yen. The support of the bottom of this range has now been broken below, and we saw the dollar extending its losses to about 78.21, and today even lower, 78.13 yen. We are seriously making an advancement into what I like to call the 400th intervention zone. What do I mean by that? You would recall that this low here that we reached in March after the earthquake where the dollar was literally falling out of bed versus the Japanese yen has prompted, and that low was 76.34. That level had prompted the Bank of Japan to step in along with other major central banks and intervene in the currency markets in order to curb the rapid appreciation of their currency, the Japanese yen. That intervention was followed by a tremendous rally of the U.S. dollar, moving from as low as 76.34 to as high as 85.52 yen, which was a nice rally of about, uh, well, a little bit over 900 pips. Can that happen again? Will the dollar rally 900 pips? I'm not sure whether it's going to be a 900 pips of a rally. But if the Bank of Japan were to intervene again, we could see a few hundred pips possibly that the U.S. dollar could rally from the recently established lows. The big question, however, is will the Bank of Japan actually step in and intervene again? I think that it will, especially if they felt that as they like to call it, the moves in the Japanese yen have been one-sided, meaning only up. So now uh, the big question is, at what level will we reach that threshold where the Bank of Japan would have to step in and draw a new line in the sand? Will that level be the current lows? It points at around... 78 yen, or will it be the pre-intervention lows at a little bit above 76 yen? So that's the difficult part to determine what would be the price level. This is why I call the area of approximately 400 pips between 80 yen and 76 yen the intervention zone. And in at any time, Within this 400 pip area, or 400 pip range between 76 and 80 yen, I'm expecting that we might witness another intervention by the Bank of Japan. As usual, the actual intervention is normally preceded, and uh, we have witnessed that happening in the recent week or so. The actual interventions normally are... Uh, preceded by a strong jawboning type of statements. As I mentioned earlier, several Japanese officials, finance ministers there and other officials have come out and said that they're carefully monitoring the currency markets and uh, that the current moves in the Japanese yen have been one-sided. And uh, they have also mentioned that they have the means to step in again if necessary. So this is why I think that the next step is obviously verbal interventions do not work. They could stop things, they could stop the bleeding for maybe a few hours or maybe even for a day or two, but in the long run, they never work. As a matter of fact, even interventions in the long run, they do, they're they not as effective because if they were as effective, the U.S. dollar would not have been going back down to the pre-intervention levels in March. So um, even unilateral intervention here 
has managed to stop the bleeding for the U.S. dollar. In recent months, the dollar has been seriously dropping lower and lower and lower. Only the drops have been a little bit slower than normally they, they would have normally been because of the potential for intervention. And you can see that slow drift, a few pips lower and lower and lower and lower, just testing the nerve of the Bank of Japan. Again, do not be caught by surprise if you get to see an actual intervention happening here in the days ahead, especially if the dollar continues to fall lower and lower towards that 76.35 post-World War II um, low for the dollar-yen exchange rate. And that's, of course, the pre-intervention low. Intervention happened on, uh, what was it, the 15th? 17, March 17. So we'll watch that area, 400 pips, which is the intervention area. Um, another uh, important report next week after the Bank of Japan, um, or rather Consumer Price Index from Japan, uh, is going to be the Eurozone, uh, another inflation report as well from the Eurozone, will be the flash estimate of the harmonized index of consumer prices, which is the main gauge of inflation, preferred by the European Central Bank. And we can see for another month, this is the preliminary estimate for inflationary pressures in July. We could see them remaining elevated in the Eurozone at 2.7% year-over-year in July, same as the 2.7% year-over-year reading in the month of June. So we already know, and it's not a secret, that these elevated inflationary pressures in the Eurozone have prompted the uh, bank, uh, European Central Bank to hike interest rates twice already, and the market continues to anticipate that there may be even another third interest rate hike by the end of the year by the European Central Bank. The European Union Summit is behind us. We've seen some more comprehensive measures, although many have their doubts, including myself, that uh, they will be sufficient enough. They sound good on theory, but the main concern is that uh, the European Financial Stability Facility, which has been given a lot of functions and a lot of uh, um, ability to be very uh, much of a um, backup and, and sort of a firewall, even, if you will, uh, for, for the crisis, uh, to stop the crisis, the debt crisis in the Eurozone from spreading. The problem is that many are saying that it's lacking ammunition. In other words, it doesn't have enough of money in it. It's only 440 billion euros of a rescue fund uh, designed to buy debt across the stressed euro nations. And some are saying now with Italy being dragged into the crisis and Spain, those are two of the largest, the third largest economy in the eurozone is the Italian economy. Now when we get to see Ireland and Greece and, uh, and Portugal were a different game, they're small economies. So 100 billion uh, euros here, 100 billion euros there could be helpful to contain things or patch things up at least with uh, Greece or Ireland or, or uh, Portugal. Now when it gets to Italy or Spain, the numbers get much larger. Some are estimating that that European Financial Stability Facility Fund has to be expanded to 2 trillion euros at least. That means more than three times as large that it needs to get than the current 440 billion that are in it. So that's the concern there, that they may not have enough money uh, in that fund. On top of that, another risk is that all of these comprehensive measures that were agreed on and announced at the European Union Summit last Thursday have to be approved by individual governments of the individual members of the European Union. And we know how difficult that has been. There has been significant political hurdles. So I don't really feel that the worst is behind us there. Um, but we did have at least some bold measures in action that was demonstrated by European Union leaders. That has really put the focus on the problems in the United States. And that has given the euro... The opportunity, as I will show you here with uh, the daily chart of the euro-dollar pair, 
the euro to manage a nice rally as a result of these news versus the U.S. dollar. Although it broke below the bottom of its uh, two-month range, uh, the bottom was dollar thirty-nine sixty-nine. The euro dropped as well as dollar thirty-eight thirty-seven. The euro really capitalized on these positive news from the eurozone, and also on the U.S. dollar weakness as the focus shifted on the problems in the U.S. to go back into and climb back into its previously established range. That's the range once again between roughly dollar forty cents. And dollar forty-seven cents, about seven hundred fifths of a range, a little bit over that, because the low of bottom of the range is dollar thirty-nine sixty-nine. Top of the range is dollar forty-six ninety-six, a little bit below dollar forty-seven cents. So we're seeing nothing more at this point than the euro-dollar pair simply trading within its range, and it's right now sort of in the middle of that range, which which doesn't really get me excited a whole lot. When we're back into a range-bound type of trading, opportunities should be looked at either at the, close to the top of the range or close to the bottom of the range, not close to the middle of the range. At least that's my rule of thumb. So the euro dollar at these price levels doesn't really get me all that excited uh, unless we begin to see it faltering to break above these previous highs at uh, dollar forty-five seventy-seven, and that would be interesting because that would mean that we may not see it climb exactly up to the top of the range at the dollar forty-seven cents area. And we could see it starting to reverse that upward momentum and move back to the bottom of the range uh, if dollar forty-five seventy-seven highs are not broken now. Uh, Friday's high should be closely watched. That was dollar forty-four thirty-seven. I mean, these levels of resistance, the, the good thing about this uh, euro-dollar pair trading in this range is that we're trading within a familiar territory. There's no unknowns here. Um, there's no price levels that we need to guess. It's the same old previous support and resistance levels that have been already established. On the way up, the resistance levels will be uh, more than likely respected and watched. On the way down, the support levels uh, will see the same. So... Dollar forty uh, four and a half area previously was level areas of resistance. You can see that area, dollar forty four and a half, dollar forty four forty one. This was the high on Friday, dollar forty four thirty seven on the four pips below that level. So that's your most immediate area of resistance. A break above there sends us to uh, the large quarter point potentially at the dollar forty five cents, maybe even to challenge the highs from uh, July fourth at the dollar forty five seventy seven. A break above dollar forty-five seventy-seven could send us to the top of the range at the dollar and forty-seven cents. It's a range-bound trading, same resistance levels on the way up that should be respected. Don't forget dollar forty-five twenty right there in this area. Uh, still, again, that's the large quarter point of the dollar forty-five cents, playing a key role of resistance there. Those are levels that many of you should know. Even if I came up, uh, woke you up and called you at three o'clock in the morning tonight. You should be able to tell me these resistance levels if you've at least been paying attention to the euro dollar pair in the last couple of months. So um, elevated inflationary pressures in the eurozone, keeping the uh, potential for another rate hike by the European Central Bank. On the other hand, stark differences between the monetary policies of the United States uh, Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank. One is hiking rates. The other one, keeping rates extremely low and their monetary policy ultra-accommodated. Speaking about ultra-accommodated monetary policies, the GDP report next week could be another weak link when it comes to the U.S. economic data. This is going to be the main economic report, the top spotlight event of next week. The U.S. GDP, gross domestic product for the second quarter, of 2011. This is, of course, just a preliminary estimate. And the market is expecting a uh, economic growth at 1.6% uh, quarter over quarter. What that means is that we could see a weaker economic growth compared with the fourth quarter of 2011, which was 1.9%. Those numbers are far cry from growth in the fourth quarter, which was a little bit above 3%. So you can see that progressively, quarter after quarter, we have been seeing slower economic growth. And in the second quarter, U.S. economic growth could be slower than the first quarter. What that means is that the Fed 
concerns, their fears that the pace of recovery here in the United States has been, quote, frustratingly slow, end of quote, could be confirmed, in my opinion. And this could be yet another weak economic report. I already gave you examples with four other reports before the GDP report next week. And if the GDP report shows a slower economic growth in the United States, then that's the Fed view, that the recovery has been frustratingly slow. What does that mean? If that, that continues to be the view from the Fed, then we can anticipate that there are not going to be in very much of a hurry to start tightening policy anytime soon. Consumer sentiment is the final top ten event for last week. I'm, I'm wrapping it up here in the next minute because we're running out of time. Consensus forecasts are expecting a small increase to 64.1 from 63.8 in uh, the previous month. I wouldn't be surprised, however, if the consumer sentiment index comes a little bit weaker than expected. That should wrap up the sequence of unimpressive U.S. economic data for next week. I am running out of time, and uh, before we finish, let me remind you that uh, I would like to welcome you and invite you to listen to my All Things Forex live daily broadcast Monday through Friday throughout next week on my website, allthingsforex.com, for a daily analysis of the currency markets and the major currency pairs. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks to our friends at fxstreet.com. And have a great evening and a great week. And I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time.